to start our recording. Um, many people have asked me if this will be recorded and available for people to view after the workshop, and yes, it will be. We've been recording all of our workshops and then we post them to YouTube afterwards and we'll send out a link to all the participants and everybody who registered. So if you're somebody who starts the workshop and then for some reason you have to leave early, don't worry, you will get um, a link to the recording afterwards. So although people are still arriving, I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Angie Hong and I coordinate the East Metro Water Resource Education Program. And we're gonna be talking about native shoreline buffers this evening. Uh, Tara Kelly, a landscape restoration specialist and Cameron Blake, communications and project technician at Washington Conservation District will also be presenting. So we're each going to have a little bit different piece of the story that we'll share with you tonight. Um, as you are dropping your notes in the chat, just go ahead and keep doing that. I'm going to try <clears throat> using our interactive poll feature in a moment and um, we'll find out if that works or not. Uh, but what we are going to talk about this evening, I'm going to start us off with the what and the why. So what are native buffers? Why are they important? What are the rules around them and why do those exist? And then, especially for the people who live on lakes and rivers, talk about some of the common scenarios that we run into where people are doing things on their property that they might run into a watershed or a wetland buffer rule. Uh, Tara's gonna talk about improving buffer habitat. Cameron will be talking about seasonal maintenance and invasive species, weeds. That's one of the biggest questions we always get from people. And then we're going to wrap it up by talking about resources and funding available to landowners. So <clears throat> I'm going to see if I am able to launch this polling feature right now. Um, attendees are now viewing the questions. So this is just three quick questions that you can answer at your leisure as we begin the workshop, um, just to get an idea of you know, who we're hearing from. So the first question, do you live on a lake, stream, wetland, pond, or river? Um, does your property currently have a natural buffer? And which topics are you most interested in learning about tonight? <laughs> so go ahead and keep answering those poll questions and I'm going to minimize that and keep us moving along here. So Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes. It's a huge part of our heritage. We've got um, you know, millions of acres of wetlands. We in Washington County, where our office is located, have both the Mississippi and the St. Croix River and approximately 12 or 20 uh, designated trout streams. The unfortunate reality, however, is that over half of Minnesota's lakes, rivers, and streams are classified as impaired. Uh, so I used to use this slide and the percentage was 40. And then the MPCA updated their records just based on new water monitoring data a couple of years ago and determined that it was actually even more than that. So although we love our waters, we sometimes are in danger of you know, loving our waters to death. And the reason we're going to be talking about buffers today is because they're really important both for water quality, but also for habitat. So each of these animals that you're seeing a photo of is a threatened or endangered or species of concern in Minnesota. Um, modern butterflies, almost everybody knows about those, has heard about how their um, species numbers have been declining over the years. The red-headed woodpecker, uh, I just opened up my Minnesota Conservation Volunteer magazine today and there was one of those little question and answers and somebody was saying, I used to see these all the time in the 60s and I never see them anymore. It's because their numbers have really declined a lot. Uh, the bee that you're looking at, the rusty patch bumblebee is our new designated Minnesota state bee and is also a federally endangered species. 
the turtle in the bottom, the Blandings turtle. We find it in Northern Washington County and it is a threatened species. And then we've got trout, which are also a species of concern. So we know from research that as we change the landscape and especially as we develop the landscape, we see a lot of impacts on water. And the reason is that in an undeveloped landscape, only about 10% of the snow and the rain actually run off into lakes and streams. A lot more than you would expect soaks into the ground and goes down into shallow and deep aquifers. And about 40% of it uh, is evaporated or pulled up by plants and evapotranspirated. And as we develop our landscape, especially along the shoreline areas, we are doubling, tripling, um, quintupling the amount of runoff that's going into our lakes and rivers and also having a lot less water going into the ground. So we're kind of doing a double thing that we're putting more water into the lakes and rivers and less is soaking into the groundwater. Um, these are just images of what that looks like in various places in our area that you might be familiar with. So along shorelines, um, they know that it is particularly harmful. So just looking at these photos, we're looking at like a completely natural shoreline, your kind of old fashioned 1950s cabin on a lake. And um, I think this used to be animated and you can no longer see it. There, there's a big giant house behind this big brown arrow. But as we move from these undeveloped to less developed to more developed scenarios along shorelines, we see um, a huge increase in the amount of sediment that goes into the lake, uh, amount of phosphorus that goes in. Phosphorus is what is feeding algae growth. And um, we see just a lot more runoff happening. So that leads to us seeing periodic algae blooms during the summertime. One, one pound of phosphorus is enough to grow 500 pounds of algae. So a little bit goes a long way in a kind of bad way. Uh, it also really affects water property values. So a study by Bemidji State showed that a three foot decrease in water clarity leads to 22% decline in property value in rural areas. People will pay more to live on a clean lake than they will to live on a dirty lake, basically. So for all of these reasons, Minnesota has uh, shoreland management rules. And these are developed by the DNR, but they are um, enforced adopted and enforced by local governments. So the DNR is not the one that, that regulates and enforce, enforces the shoreland rules. It is the local city, county, or township, depending on where you live. Um, and these rules apply to all the public water statewide that meet uh, the criteria that they are um, lakes bigger than 10 acres in cities or bigger than 25 acres in counties, uh, type three, four, and five wetlands and um, some other rivers and streams. Basically, it applies to a lot of, a lot of water bodies. Um, so the shoreland district boundary covers an area that is a thousand feet from the ordinary high water level for lakes and wetlands and 300 feet from the ordinary high water level for rivers and streams or the 100 year floodplain boundary, whichever is greater. So within that area, those gray areas, that's where those Minnesota shoreland rules apply. Um, and the shoreland rules govern things like lot size, structure setbacks, and vegetation management. Um, they also address impervious surface limits. So this is all things to protect the habitat, make sure that we're limiting the amount of sediment and phosphorus that run off into lakes, streams, rivers, wetlands. Okay, I just want to, um, <clears throat> okay, don't have audio or video, but somebody else said it's fine. Okay, just wanted to check to make sure I hadn't blown through any questions coming up yet. Um, if you don't have audio, sometimes it works to log off and log back on again. Um, one of the things that is the biggest motivation for a homeowner is just the idea of protecting your shoreline, 
by leaving uh, native buffers, even if they're low quality native buffers, leaving them in place. And so I always start by showing this particular photo. Um, this is two adjoining property owners and one left that little strip of land closest to the water in just kind of a natural state. And the other person moved in and started mowing down to the shoreline. Over five years, only five years time, there was a dramatic loss due to erosion on the property that was mowing down to the shoreline. So this is the number one way that you can protect your property value if you are buying a home that's on a wetland or lake. Uh, it's expensive land and you wanna keep it from floating away. Um, keeping the natural buffers in place is one of the best ways that you can do that. Um, the reason is that native plants have really deep root systems. So looking at this diagram, over on the very far left, Kentucky bluegrass right here. They have it, Kentucky bluegrass, this is our normal lawn. It's got really short roots, two to three inches deep. In contrast, native plants have roots that could be five, 10, sometimes even 15 feet deep. And they create these really fibrous networks that hold the soil in place. They help water to soak in when it rains and they're drought tolerant, so they don't need to be watered during the summer when we get a stretch of no rain. Um, the other thing that is often a motivating factor for people who live on the water is stopping this from happening. Um, lake and lawn equals geese, and if you plant native plants or maintain your native buffers, you keep the geese off of your property and send them off to the community parks or some other person in your neighborhood who has a lawn that looks like this. So what we are encouraging people to do, whether it is a lake, whether it's a wetland, is to think of um, your yard as the space that's up close to your house and trying to maintain the space that's closer to the lake or the wetland as natural as possible. So this diagram from the Minnesota DNR shows how you could have a little path, you can have a dock, you can even have a tiny little sandy beach but maintaining aquatic vegetation in the lake and on the shoreline to hold the shoreline in place and provide habitat. So just some examples of what this looks like in real life. Here is a project on Forest Lake that the Comfort Lake Forest Lake Watershed District provided cost share funding for. Um, really beautiful, Washington Conservation District helped uh, the homeowner to design this project. Uh, here is an example from the Rice Creek Watershed District, another really beautiful example. Um, and this one, I cannot tell you the lake that it is on, but I'm pretty sure that this one is down in Dakota County. So just three examples of different looking designs and styles, but using those native plants to create a landscape that's attractive, but still has all of those benefits. Um, so I talked a bit about the Minnesota shoreland rules. I don't want to overstay my welcome too much by harboring on rules too much, but within most of the metro area, there are also watershed districts. And watershed districts address water issues, including flooding and protection of water quality, and will often have their own rules in addition to what the state has, and they may be more protective. Um, for example, the Browns Creek Watershed District has a designated trout stream, and so they sometimes have more protective rules in order to, um, you know, really protect that resource. If you are in Washington County, we have eight watershed management areas, and we work closely with all of the area watershed districts to um, provide assistance to landowners for shoreline and wetland projects and also um, to help to just educate and inform people about the rules. So in the example of the Browns Creek Watershed District, they um, may require a buffer along a lake stream or wetland in which there is no mowing, no structures, no tree cutting and no driveways allowed. Um, <clears throat> there could also be rules that say we don't allow riprap, retaining walls, creating sand or sand beach or sand blankets in locations where they don't already exist. So for example, Browns Creek Watershed District will only permit alterations that address erosion issues, not just because somebody wants to have rocks to sit along the shoreline. 
And then for the few of you who may be on the St. Croix River, you probably already know that there are additional rules that govern the St. Croix River because it is a designated wild and scenic river. And so I'm not gonna get into depth detail on what the differences are in the St. Croix River rules, but just suffice to say that there's, there's more. <clears throat> so, a couple of the common scenarios that we see people having a lot of. Can I do that with my property? Okay, so here is scenario number one. I have this beautiful lakeshore property and I wanna know, can I clear the trees to see the water better? Well, first of all, we're gonna say, oh, do you really need to do that? Because this photo to me looks exactly like the DNR diagram that I showed earlier of what we hope that people's lakeshore properties will be like. It's still got a big, beautiful lawn, but it's closer up to the house and it's got lots of nice trees and shrubs down by the lake to protect that shoreline area. In fact, this is actually um, the yard of one of the board members from the Comfort Lake Forest Lake Watershed District. Um, but if you did want to clear trees and vegetation, you'd have to look at where you are and what kinds of rules exist. So along the St. Croix River Way, the rule is going to be no vegetation removal or tree limb removal within the ordinary high water level and bluff setback zone. None. Um, within Sh Minnesota Shoreland Management Districts, you can remove 10 to 20 percent of trees and shrubs without a DNR permit. 10 to 20 percent, not the entire shoreline. Um, but you should always be contacting your city, county, township zoning administrator to determine if the property is within a special management district and if there's other rules. Because there could be watershed district buffer rules and you really just wanna make sure that you know what all the rules are before you accidentally get yourself in trouble. Um, here is another common scenario if you live on a lake, creating a beach. So, just like last time, contact city, county, township, watershed district um, to make sure that you are following all the applicable rules. Um, a DNR permit is required to cover emergent vegetation unless already authorized by an aquatic plant management permit from the DNR fisheries to create a beach in a posted fish spawning area. Um, some of the guidelines for the beach. It needs to be clean, inorganic sand or gravel free of pollutants and nutrients. It needs to be no more than six inches thick and 50 feet wide along the shore or half of the width of the lot, whichever is less, then no more than 10 feet waterward of the ordinary high water level. And this is one of those key ones, installation of the sand or gravel may only be repeated once, not exceeding the same amount and dimensions of the original sand blanket. And the tricky thing about this is it's only once per the property, not once per property owner. So if you have a home on a lake that's turned over several times, each new property owner can't come in and keep putting a new beach down. And if you have to keep putting a new beach down, that tells you that there probably shouldn't be a beach there in the first place. It's probably an area where there's a lot of erosion. And if the sand's getting repeatedly washed away, it's going somewhere, it's going into the lake. Um, another common question is, oh, hey, I'm creating a fire ring. Well, if you have the kind of fire ring that I have where it's just kind of the metal thing and you plop it down next to the lake, that's no big deal. But if your fire ring is more like a patio with an embedded fire ring in it, then it's going to potentially run into some of these rules around buffers and shorelines. So contact your city, county, watershed district and find out what rules exist. Um, another one, stairs, lifts, and docks. Docks should not obstruct navigation or create a safety hazard, shouldn't harm fish and wildlife habitat, must allow water to flow freely beneath. Um, a DNR permit is required in some of these circumstances, and like in all these other scenarios, you should be talking to your city, county, watershed district um, to find out what the local rules are. Adding additions to the house. I'm getting close to the end to common scenarios, just in case you're getting worried. Um, so yes, you should be contacting, if you learn nothing else in this presentation is that, you know, check with your city, county, township, watershed district, zoning admin to find out what rules exist. Um, for something like this, obviously you're gonna need a building permit, but you also might have minimum setback requirements and buffer rules that you are going to have to adhere to. 
Um, there's also a lot of times rules about impervious surface that you might have to, if you create a new addition on your home, create a rain garden alongside it to mitigate the extra runoff that that addition is creating. So I'm going to be turning things over to Tara in a moment to talk about um, how to enhance your buffer property. And I just want to use this opportunity to pause and see if we have any questions coming in and that rapid fire rules and whys that I just covered. And you can either share them in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself for a minute to ask a question, we can spend a minute or so to do that too. Yeah, hi, my name is Scott. Um, yeah. One of the challenges I face in one of my properties is that I have a huge bank, a steep bank and almost everything I've ever attended, you show the pictures of these beautiful uh, mm -hmm. walkout mm -hmm. lawns that are level. Um, so I think that's kind of the challenge for mine and I'm an older house, so it's really close to the water too. Um, are there some other ideas or resources you'll share later that for somebody like that, where it's not that nice gradual descent to the lake? Um, we have worked on some example projects like that along the St. Croix Riverway in Washington County. I don't think that either Tara or Cameron will probably share any pictures like that, but if you want to follow I can up contact with, after if it's okay. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say if you want to follow up by email, I could send you some information or photos from some of those projects. Because yeah, be we, we do have a number that are bluffs and are exactly what you're describing. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um oh and Michelle got a grant from the Vale Branch Watershed District. Yay, that's super exciting. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Tara then to talk about enhancing your buffer. Thanks, Angie. Can everybody hear me? I'm unmuted. Okay, good. So Angie um, did a great job of presenting what buffers are and where they're located in our landscapes, some of the important functions they play, and also then um, some of the rules and regulations that govern these areas. So the kind of second part of this um, presentation will be what you can do within your buffer after you contact your city, county, local officials. Did I get all of them, Angie? Um, these are some things you can do to um, enhance and manage these spaces. Now I want to present a, a caveat here. We're coming at this presentation from the perspective of you, you have a buffer in place, it might have trees, it might have some tall grasses, but something is there that's more of a natural state. What we're not covering tonight, but very important situations are where you have maybe turf grass all the way down to your, your shoreline or situations like that where it's going to be more of a, a, a restoration and there's a lot more design considerations and things like that that we won't go over. There are a lot of resources for those situations. Those are great projects. So just reach out to us and we will connect you to all sorts of information. But this is coming from the perspective of you have an existing buffer and you're just kind of wondering what you can do with it. Um, and so the pieces we're going to cover is enhancement, maintenance and invasive species. And this isn't necessarily the order of events, right? There might be times that you would want to think about doing invasive species removal on the front end. So you're not messing with a bunch of plants that you already put in. There might be times that you really want to do the planting first to create um, some screening with shrubbery before you potentially do some buckthorn removal. So just want to point that out, that that's not necessarily the order. It kind of will depend on what you're starting with and where you want to get to with your goals. So I promise this is my most boring slide. Don't worry about all the little um, lettering, focus on the colors. What I wanted to show here is how our native plant communities, um, and these are mostly native plant communities from central Minnesota, um, relate to one another and to some of these factors. And when I'm talking about a native plant community, um, 
I'm talking basically about a, a land cover type, something, a land cover type that we might find in these natural areas. So what this is organizing our native plant communities by is how similar they are to each other and also to a few different factors here. One of which, as you can see that arrow on the bottom is this nutrient factor from low nutrients over on this side, all the way to more of a, a nutrient rich environment. The other factor is moisture from really dry environments to lots of moisture availability over here. So the colors, what they represent are different, different kind of groups of native plant communities. This yellow color down in the bottom here, this represents um, prairies or more grasslands, um, even maybe a prairie that has some trees on it that would be considered more of a savanna. You can see they occupy this space where they are more nutrient rich but also very dry. And that's one of the reasons that they, they don't have as many trees and shrubs on them. And that's in contrast to this, let's call it a red orange color here, where we have um, more of a woodland community type, an oak woodland. So um, lots more trees in the canopy, but it's not super closed and, and, and dark. It still has some light that reaches through that canopy. Um, and that's in contrast to this green. This green color here are our, um, our music hardwoods, our, our maple forests. Sometimes people refer to them as the big woods. You can see they are just a little bit higher up on that moisture level, and maybe a little bit farther down on this nutrients. So what we have above this dotted line then are these wooded wetland community types. And this purple and the pink are both um, kind of unique in that they're, they're peatland systems. Um, they obviously are high on that wet side. They're poor in nutrients. And the reason is, is because based on their hydrology, they've become really isolated from their nutrient sources. These are not typically the type of native plant communities that we find in these buffer areas. The place that native plant communities are, at least the wooded native plant communities, are typically in this zone, right? They're pretty nutrient rich, they're also very moist, um, and that's where they occupy on the landscape. And what Angie pointed out is with a lot of our um, landscape um, and land use alterations, we're even exacerbating that, right? These areas are getting more water from runoff, and in that runoff they might have additional <clears throat> sediment, um, fertilizers, things like that are entering these areas. So you might be thinking, gosh, if I was a plant, if I had all the nutrients and all the moisture, like that seems like a pretty awesome place to, to grow, right? And that's true to an extent, but it's also a really great place for, for weeds to grow, right? There's just a lot of competition in these areas. And not only that, there's often a lot of disturbances that hit these systems. You can think about um, these are areas that potentially get flooded even up to weeks at a time. If they're on a lake shore, they might have wave action. They might have ice heave. Um, because the water tables are, are higher in these areas, uh, the tree's root systems often don't reach down as far. So you get trees tipping over and tip up mounds. So these can be uh, areas that have a lot of disturbance. And at the same time, we're asking them to do a lot of, of benefits for us, right? Water quality, habitat, all these things that are benefits that native plant communities provide. I like to refer to them as ecosystem services. We're asking them to provide a lot of service and they're kind of challenging places to be a plant. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind as you think about how to manage your buffer um, and give uh, yourself as the manager and these uh, communities, these native plant communities, just a lot of grace and set your expectations accordingly because they can be challenging places to, to really manage pristinely, I guess. So we saw this slide earlier. I think it bears repeating because it's, it really demonstrates some of the, the value that um, these native plants can provide. Angie had, I think, an arrow pointing to here. That's our turf grass. The rest of these are um, examples of native plants and their root systems. And you can just imagine how well these plants can kind of slow water down, 
help it to infiltrate. All of these roots provide channels where the water can um, move into the ground. Sometimes turf grass is not as dramatic as concrete, but it can become pretty good hard pan. So these plants can help break up that soil and provide these channels that move down. And just think about the carbon sequestration these things are providing. It's just, it's beautiful to me. So the, there's just a lot of ecosystem services that um, these native plants are providing. And oftentimes that's in contrast to some of the invasive species we see out there. And Cameron will go into more detail about invasive species, but I just wanted to give you a kind of a mental picture of some of the differences. The top picture is a, um, it's a floodplain forest down along Valley Creek. Um, it's mostly buckthorn that I see as, as small trees, very little growing in the understory. Mind you, this was, this was not a, a middle of the growing season picture, but I don't even see a lot of the residual um, plant material there either. And that's in contrast to this bottom picture. This is more of a wetland complex over in this area. Um, and this canopy is much more open, much less buckthorn, and you can see the difference. Different systems, but that ground layer is much more intact with the ferns and the sedges and the flowers. Um, so these uh, invasive species like buckthorn can really change the system and really impact, you can imagine for water quality, those, um, th that soil is not being held in place very well by a lot of deep plant roots. We've also been talking about the ecosystem services uh, provided by buffers in terms of habitat. Um, here I'll be presenting some work by uh, a writer, uh, entomologist named Doug Tallamy. I have recommended his book so many times, I kind of want to start getting royalties from this. Um, he's just, it's a great, it's a great book. It's one of probably maybe even five that he's written. Um, this one just happens to be the most well-known. But as I mentioned, he's an entomologist. And what he really has done is looked at how you can support wildlife with even in your own backyards. And he's looking at it from the point of insects, right? That's his background. Um, but the important role they play, they're really that foundation of our food web. Um, the more insects you have, the more birds you can have, the more mammals, they really provide that good foundation um, for, for our wildlife. Um, and so what he did is he basically looked at a bunch of different tree species and calculated how many caterpillars um, how many different species of caterpillars they could provide for. I know these are a little bit blurry up top here, um, but I'll just point out a few for you. At the top of this list are the oaks. 557 different species of caterpillars um, can make use of the oaks. Cherries, willows, uh, birches, and poplars, a lot of our native tree species are really high on this list. If we go to the other end of the list, um, at the very bottom here, we see our buckthorn. And this is the common buckthorn, um, only 10. Um, the other one I wanted to point out is, here's another buckthorn. This is glossy buckthorn, which tends to um, favor a little bit wetter areas. So buffers um, only has 11. So um, another example of the ecosystem services that our native plants can provide However, I also want to use this to um, point out that it's, it, it can be great. There are really great native species that unfortunately kind of low on this list. I hate to do it, but this species right here, red bud, Cercis canadensis is one of my favorite um, trees. It's a little bit more Eastern in distribution. Um, it's a great native plant. It's pretty, not very high on this list. And I'm sure there are non-native or even invasives um, that are higher up on this list than maybe we would want to see them. Um, so it's not a perfect system, but I would argue in general, our native species provide overall more ecosystem services than our non-native or invasive species. So I think there is a lot of challenge out there managing these buffers because they are important, they are regulated, um, and sometimes trees um, can be removed and sometimes they can't. But generally that is to um, help 
encourage these native species and provide and really layer on those ecosystem services in these buffers and not continue to have these species that might be considered invasive and have some element of harm. So I just wanted to kind of break that down a little bit that um, it, it is there is some gray there, but in general, our native species do a much better job to help provide. So if that wasn't enough nuance for you, I'll also present the nuance of the slope. And I'm glad that question came up earlier because I did want to point out that this is just a super generalized picture of a slope and a buffer, right? You might not have open water. You might have one that looks more like this, which sounds like was the case. Um, so what I would like you to take some time to do in your planning and, and management is just get to know what where your zones are. And by zones, I mean, where do you have standing water maybe all year long or a, a, a normal year, some years that can be higher than, than others? Where do you just see it in the springtime, but then it kind of, um, you know, ebbs and, and, and flows back down. Um, where is your area that's typically fairly dry most of the time? And that'll really help you get a sense of what plants would do the best in what locations. Because as I mentioned, it can be challenging. So you might as well get the best fit for your plants that you can. And that's gonna be by understanding really the hydrology of, of your buffer. So with that, I'm gonna just give you a couple of tips in terms of um, how you can um, increase your chance of success. And remember, this is coming from the point of you have an existing buffer, it might have trees, it might have tall grasses, but it really has that pretty significant matrix of vegetation that you're trying to potentially plant into. So we want to give as much of a boost to those plants as we can. And part of that is just starting with larger plant materials. I put a picture of a bunch of different sizes of materials here. Um, but if you, um, if there's a lot of vegetation that it's going to be competing with, just imagine that those root systems and how established they can be. Um, you're probably going to want to be in this four inch to a gallon, especially um, bigger than that, even for trees and shrubs. These smaller ones are great. I love plugs. They're so um, cost effective, but unless you're really willing to baby these things, um, you just want to give a, a little bit of a head start by planting larger materials. Also going to want to give them a head start by protecting them from weed competition, and that can be done by mulching around the base of them. There's all these kind of cool um, collars that you can put on the plants to just kind of help keep those weeds at bay and they don't cover the plant and start competing for at least the light resources. And that being said, um, these are areas that wildlife love. We want to provide for them, but gosh, they can do a number on our plants when they start eating on them. So protect them from herbivory. Um, if you, especially if you're using larger plant materials, you're just going to want to protect that investment. So I would just plan on that right from the get-go that you will need some kind of um, protection there. So that being said, I, um, I wanted to present some native species that I think will do well in these areas, even given all of this competition. Um, I try to limit myself to five trees and shrubs and five flowers and grasses in kind of that low zone and that next zone. Don't, by any means, this is not the exhaustive list. It was really hard to choose, but the perspective I was coming from is plants that can really hang. These are ones that can, um, can really compete with, with a lot of pressure from different weeds and other competition. So that is my, my caveat. So in the top five trees and shrubs for kind of this lower area, I'm not talking about standing water all year, really talking about the wet feet, especially in the springtime and maybe um, eventually dries out a little bit. Um, I want to present some shrubs. Um, red osier and uh, pussy willow can really do some good wet feet. And these are just really fun. They have good color and texture. Um, so I love to you know, use them for different planters. Also with the pussy willow, a lot of the willows can be pretty bossy. Pussy willow is a little bit less so, 
Um, but the willows are so great for um, pollinators, especially they flower really early. So they give that food source really early in the season. I think willows were, gosh, I think they're even third on the list of, of caterpillar species. So um, I think those are two really good choices, especially for pretty wet areas. And then another selection for just a little bit higher out of that wet feet zone would be a, a nanny berry. This is one of the viburnums. There's a lot of different viburnums and they all um, have great benefits. But this one's a great plant for, um, for wildlife and it's also very um, attractive as well. I also wanted to include some trees. Let me use that. Um, the two trees I picked are cottonwood and silver maple. Now I know these are not trees you might want to put in your boulevard or right in the middle of your lawn. They can be kind of messy. The cottonwood obviously has um, cotton seed heads that it produces and the silver maple can drop. It drops a lot of twigs. Um, but out in a buffer, I think those uh, that, that wouldn't be as big of an issue. Um, these are trees that can grow with wet feet and once established, they can handle some pretty long periods of flooding um, and really help hold that shoreline in place. If you've ever been out like on the St. Croix in the springtime and you see these islands that are just covered in water and there's trees growing out there, I, I'm guessing it was probably one of those two species that they just, they just thrive in these areas. So those would be pretty good choices for um, some pretty wet conditions if you wanna plant trees. Okay, my top five grasses and flowers for this kind of lower zone. I did want to give a, a grass option. There's a lot of sedges out there that um, that can really hang as well, but I limited myself to five. So we're just going forward. Cord grass is, is a great one. It can really um, compete well. It's obviously very tall and can create a pretty big stand. So you want to use it accordingly where you don't mind um, some height and some some bossiness. This is one of the few that um, can actually hang with reed canary grass. Um, it you know, can be used if you've got an area that's all reed canary grass and you kind of even wanna prevent it from moving into a different area, you can almost use it as like a wall of cord grass just to prevent that reed canary grass from, from creeping. Another one that um, I really like and it's on the flower side, but it also is very tall, um, can create a dense stand is this Joe pie weed, um, but it does have this beautiful flower and insects love it. And I used it in my wedding bouquets. So I have a um, kind of an affinity for that plant. So I had to pick it. A um, Couple that are uh, a little less um, creating a dense stand, but definitely have some, some competitive abilities would be this blue vervain. Um, there is also a more of an upland version of this plant called hoary vervain if you like the look of it, but you want to use it in more of a, an upland. And also I wanted to give you an example of something shorter. This is mountain mint. It's not nearly as tall as some of the rest of these that I've been, prevent, been presenting, but it can definitely create a nice colony and, and compete. What's also fun about it is you can crush the leaves and it smells really lovely. Lastly, for this group, uh, I wanted to give a fall bloomer. This is one of my favorite asters, New England aster. It can do pretty wet conditions. I wouldn't say, um, you know, standing water conditions, but if you, if you want an aster for that situation, um, probably the wettest aster that I know of is the red stemmed. So that might be better than this one if you, if you really wanna go wet with it. But this one's a good one. And it's, it's, it is a pretty competitive species, especially for the asters. Moving to our top five trees and shrubs in the upper area, there's a ton of plants that um, can handle these areas and be super competitive. So if something that I present doesn't immediately jive with you, um, there's, there's a lot to choose from. But I picked hazelnut, I love hazelnut. It's um, a beautiful color. It's really important for, um, for wildlife. I think I've got two of them in my yard in my little still water lot, that's how much I like it. I also wanted to present bush honeysuckle. This is a much shorter shrub. The hazelnut does get pretty tall. Um, bush honeysuckle really probably only gets two or three feet. 
and it's just this low moundy spready thing it will spread so be careful i almost think of it as more of a, a ground cover of the shrub world and i have a bunch of that in my yard as well so those are two great shrubs um, and then i did want to point out some trees that i think are just really great for these types of um Upland areas that provide great wildlife habitat. Basswood's great for pollinators. Red oak, those of you that are on like the blufflands, like along the St. Croix, this is a really good one that likes those soil types over there. Um, so these are really great species, but there's many, many more you can choose from. If I had to pick top five flowers and grasses to interplant into a buffer in the upper area, I wanted to choose another grass. I chose big blue stem. It is a little bit taller. It can be bossy, but it, it can compete. So that would be a good one if you just wanna get stuff going out there. Um, I also love ox eye sunflower. It's also tall, but it's just so cheerful and happy. And um, it's not technically a sunflower, but it is in the aster family. So it acts a lot like a sunflower. And this is a little bit shorter. So these are both taller species, but this uh, blue hyssop is a great shorter plant that can really be a great spreader and it's just a bee magnet. Um, the other really fun thing about this is you can crush the leaves and it smells like a licorice. Um, it's just a really great plant and it I think would do well in these um, natural areas. And I would say bergamot's very similar. You guys probably have seen this one or a horticultural version of it can be red, um, but the, the native ones are typically this kind of pale pink to purple and it can really spread and, and hold its own. The leaves crushed also smell really beautiful as well. Lastly, I wanted a fall flowering something. Um, so I picked stiff goldenrod. It has just really beautiful flowers, these flat topped yellow flowers. It's not super tall. Um, but it can be competitive. Um, and this is a picture of it actually hanging out with a bunch of big blue stems. You can see how they kind of pair together. And I believe that is all of my slides. I'm gonna turn it over to Cameron, unless, I don't know, Angie, if we wanna, have there been a lot of questions or we wanna roll into Cameron and then pause? Um, I'm wondering if maybe we should roll into Cameron. Um, there is a question about Buckthorn, which I'm pretty sure he will talk about. Um, a question about what if your standing water reaches beyond 1,000 foot buffer. I think you did talk about some that go deeper into the water. And where can you buy the weed collar? So maybe we can just hit some of those answers in the chat while Cameron starts talking. And then stick around after the presentation and we can answer more questions then. All right, I'm getting my PowerPoint loaded here, hopefully. So hopefully not gonna to be too much overlap um, with what we've already seen, but also echoing some of the same themes. Um, wanted to start off uh, the same way Angie and Tara did is uh, first making sure you know, um, if you see an area buffer, and you're, you're wondering if you can go out and do some work on there. First, check who's responsible for the maintenance. If you can, it could be the HOA, um, it could be the city or a township, it could be the watershed district you're in, or uh, the landowner can sometimes. So just, just check and make sure you're, you're allowed and everyone's okay with you doing some work out there uh, if, you, if you're interested in doing that. Um, why maintain these areas and buffers, exactly what, Tara has been talking about um, if you want the the most ecological services out uh, that you can get out of these areas you want to maintain it to make sure they don't just turn into a, a source of weeds and invasive species sometimes the because of how competitive these areas can be um, the natives can have a, a tough time competing sometimes so some of the maintenance that can be involved, um, I included some examples that might be more specific to stormwater features or rain gardens, but I just wanted to include it anyway, just in case uh, you see these sorts of features around you as well. Um, sometimes these practices have uh, an inlet, which needs to be cleaned out. Um, it collects some of the sediment. And then um, mostly the maintenance is involved with the vegetation. So in the spring, 
uh, you can see the senesce vegetation that's left over. Usually in buffers, you don't really worry about this. This is more if it's a smaller scale practice or a little bit more visible, you might want to remove the senesce vegetation just for the appearances. Um, but most of the work in buffers with vegetative maintenance involves kind of monitoring for uh, any invasive species or noxious, noxious weeds or aggressive species that might be out competing um, the desired native species. And then as part of the maintenance, uh, if you're going to try and enhance the habitat by introducing um, new native plants, you want to assist their establishment. Uh, like Tara was saying, try and protect them from browse and assist with uh, if there's light or nearby competition from other plants, try and help those whatever you add actually get established and and grow. So just briefly um, with there's a lot of different technical terminology sometimes with plants. Um, so when we say an invasive species uh, to be categorized in that way, it means that it's not native to the area and it is can actually um, produce some harm, economic or environmental harm. Um, another term you might hear is exotic or non-native alien species. So those are ones that maybe they're not, they've not been defined as invasive yet, but they're, they're not from around here. Um, they were probably introduced in some way. Uh, so invasive species management, we try, try and um, use the principles of integrated pest management, which is just trying to use the most current information um, use what we know about plants and how they work uh, to create the, the most control with the least harm um, to the environment. So this could be types of control methods could be mechanical, which is mowing or weed whipping or hand pulling, uh, biological, which is if you've heard of um, those are that's usually the state of Minnesota will release um, biological insects that will help uh, target invasive species and then uh, when kind of when all else fails, there, there are chemical methods of um, treating invasive species with herbicide. And uh, usually these management techniques, we try and look at um, what the life cycle of the plant is. So I was going to briefly mention just the, the different life cycles um, that plants use for their um, reproduction. So uh, an annual species um, to try and imagine what the plant's doing. Basically, it, it grows, it produces seed, it drops seed, and then the plant doesn't really come back and that dies. So it relies on producing that seed to come back again. Oh, I didn't know there was a, there we go. Um, for biennials, this is a plant that it starts off maybe as a rosette or just a vegetative form the first year. And then the second year is when it flowers and uh, produces seed and then dies off. Uh, so example of this one would be garlic mustard if you've heard of that one. Uh, perennials are some of the tougher ones to deal with if you see those in a buffer, uh, a perennial invasive species because the, uh, the plant doesn't really die off, it just, uh, it doesn't just rely on seed production to grow the next round. It will actually keep coming back from its roots basically um, year after year. So those ones can be tricky to knock back if you're seeing those type of uh, invasive species in your buffer. So I always, this is a great resource that I always like to recommend from uh, the state. Uh, it goes over some of the more common uh, noxious weeds and invasive species and management techniques for them. So I just pulled spotted knapweed for an example of what, what it looks like. So it's just a page with ID examples, um, some information about it's uh, the fruits and seed. And then most importantly, you can see, I made it bigger, but at the bottom, they'll have this kind of suggested and not suggested timing of different management techniques uh, based on, basically, if you're, if you're trying to catch the plant before it goes to seed, you need to hit it earlier in the year. And once it's gone to seed, you don't wanna mow it anymore because you're actually just doing it a favor and spreading the seed around. So all of this just, just to mean uh, that each species is gonna have a slightly different approach to management. And this is just a great resource to see what everyone already knows about it. Um, this was just some more um, tech or terminology about different invasive species and how, how serious they are, which category they are. 
which you're, if you're interested, you could dive into for a while. So some invasive species are prohibited, some are restricted and just has different, um, yeah, different approaches that the state has asked people to use. So wild parsnip is, I'll bring that up a little bit later, but that's one of the, that's a, that's a nasty one. Um, and yeah, these are the Minnesota Department of Egg list for eradicate versus control. I highlighted the ones that I'm going to mention in yellow. So this was just based on my experience of what I find to be really common um, problem plants, we'll say. So some of these are invasive species, some of them are aggressive weeds um, that just are can really overtake uh, a native planting and that you just kind of want to look out for. So woody, um, I pulled some wetland ones and then some uh, weedy species and I'll quickly go through a few pictures just to give you an idea of what things to look for. I know if you don't know a lot about plant identification, it can be hard to look at a buffer and know what kind of condition it's in and if, if they're, you know, is there a problem or is everything fine? So um, leafy spurge, Queen Anne's lace, uh, those are both, um, I mean, those are both problems. The crown vetch and birch foot trefoil are ground covers that can get really, really aggressive and kind of swamp out any native species. So those are ones that you want to get rid of. Um, spotted knapweed, Canada thistle. Uh, not, plants don't just use seed to reproduce. If you do any gardening, I'm sure you've seen plants that reproduce with rhizomes as well. So Canada thistle is one of those. So it can be really difficult to um, control once it's really established itself. Uh, curly dock is one of my least favorite ones. It just produces a lot of seed. Everyone's seen burdock. Um, Grecian foxglove is worth noting. Uh, also, if you are identifying these sorts of species and, and you want to hand pull them, make sure you look them up first. Grecian foxglove is one that you don't want to try and hand pull without gloves on. Um, uh, the wild parsnip is another. Black locust is a invasive tree um, that has a lot of thorns and is can be really painful, but that's a really bad one as well that you can find in these buffers. Japanese barberry is a more of a bush, a shrub. Oriental bittersweet is a woody vine. Um, you can also check the MDA for some of the maps of where you can find these species in the state or in the county. Tansy, uh, Dame's rocket, unfortunately really pretty, also invasive and a problem. Uh, different knotweed species are also a, a bush or shrub. Wild parsnip I mentioned earlier. Um, the other great thing about that MnDOT resource is it includes lookalikes. Um, so wild parsnip, sometimes people mix up with golden Alexander, which is a great native species. Um, but wild parsnip is also one that you want to make sure you're wearing gloves because uh, that can be harmful if you just try and pull it by hand. And then uh, for the short, in the topic of buffers and shoreline restorations. And um, these are some species that you might see more often there, the reed canary grass uh, and purple loosestrife, as well as non-native Phragmite species are starting to be a real issue. Uh, I wanted to choose buckthorn as an example of what it can take to address and manage a species properly. Um, when, so if, you're, if you have buckthorn, uh, I think everyone knows what that is now, but it's, uh, it's a, takes a, a lot of effort over a long period of time to get a uh, infestation of buckthorn under control. Um, so there's different methods depending on the size of them. So the cut stump method, method means, which is great for when they're bigger, um, you cut the tree and you somehow treat the stump, whether that's with an herbicide or you can cover it with black plastic securely, or I've heard you can cover it with a tin can but you can't just leave the stump or it'll kind of turn into, I don't know, whatever that mythical creature is where you cut the head off and it gets a bunch more. If you just cut it down, um, you'll get all of these lovely buckthorn bushes instead, which is just hard to come back to later. Uh, but it does produce a lot of woody material that you either need to uh, haul away, um, burn, for example. Weed wrenches are great for smaller buckthorn trees. Um, you don't have to use herbicide, you don't need a saw, but it can kind of disturb the soil, which maybe stirs up the seed bed that has been left by the buckthorn um, berries. So sometimes that can, if you use that for a while, the next year you might see a lot of seedlings. And then uh, basil bark is another form of um, chem chemical control, which uh, you kind of paint around the outside of the, of the tree. 
so you don't have to remove the debris, um, but it can be, it, you can miss some of the plants sometimes basically. And then, uh, yeah, some suggestions of what to do with the debris with buckthorn, that's often uh, a hard thing to think about just because once you start getting in there, you really produce a lot. So you can pile it, let it dry and burn it, make sure you get any permits needed um, for that. You can chip it. Um, you can uh, use it for projects, honestly, uh, biomass that requires, you know, some biomass. And then just the, the biggest take home message with really addressing any invasive species is the need to follow up. Um, frequently, there might be a really good first effort. And then if you don't follow up, it's just gonna come right back. And that's definitely the case with buckthorn. So if you don't, um, if you don't follow up after you start, it's, a, it's about five to six years of follow up is what it takes usually. And um, it's not just enough to get rid of the invasive species, you, you need to introduce the native species back in so they don't just keep um, you know, creating little areas of opportunity for weedy, weedy species. So um, that's where Tara's presentation comes in. And like she was saying, the order can, can vary, but that was all that I wanted. I just wanted to show one species as an example of, you wanna make sure you, you do your research if you see an invasive species uh, infestation that you're looking to control because the timing matters. Um, the methods matter. So you just want to make sure you're informed so that you're you're not wasting your energy or your time. And back to Angie. Okay. This is the part that people are often most excited about. And the last slide, if you are pressed for time, we're trying to end relatively close to the end of the hour. Um, where can you find resources in order to do more with your lakeshore wetland riverfront area? If you live in Washington County, we offer free site visits for all county residents through the Washington Conservation District. And when a person comes, these are free site visits. So when a person from our office comes out, they will talk to you about your concerns, um, tell you if there are any watershed cost your grants available. For example, if you were converting an area of turf to a native shoreline planting or building a rain garden, there might be cost share grants available. Um, and they're also going to just, you know, kind of walk you through what you mean, what you need to know, lots of recommendations. If you are in another county, there are usually similar services through the other counties um, in Chisago. The Chisago Soil and Water Conservation District also does site visits. Um, I will give you the caveat that we're not doing site visits yet because it is the middle of February still and we do have snow on the ground. Uh, we typically start doing site visits around the beginning of April. So even though it feels like spring, you have to hold your horses a little bit longer before uh, the staff will be able to start coming out. Um, there are some really great websites that you should definitely be familiar with. Um, there have been quite a few questions about plants, and so I want to skip down to the Blue Thumb website. One of the things that is very cool about Blue Thumb, it is a partnership um, of public and private entities working to promote native plantings, rain gardens, and shoreline plantings, but it has this really great website, and I... Um, I'm just going to see if I can, Cameron, I'm going to boot you off for one second just so that I can share what it looks like on the Blue Thumb website. So say you wanted to know, uh, like one of the participants said, hey, I have um, a shady area along the shoreline. What can I plant that will go there? Well, there's a plant selector tool. So you can just go here and, you know, oop, it's shady and it's gonna be medium, and then I can find this whole list of plants. And I could do the same thing if I had a area that was sunny and it's going to be an upland area, and maybe I even really wanna get picky and I wanna say I want it to be yellow because yellow is the, um, the color that I want, and then it will generate photos of all the native plants that fit those criteria. So that is a really great resource for you to um, familiarize yourselves with. Now, I hate to do this, Cameron, can you reshare <laughs> since, I, since I got out yes. of there? <laughs> yes, yep. Um, I Santi SWCD is also always willing to meet with landowners on site to talk about shoreline restorations. 
So um, in general, in your county, the Soil and Water Conservation District is going to be a good first step. Um, for shoreline, lakeshore areas in particular, the DNR has really great resources. Um, they have the DNR Lake Finder tool just to learn about your lake. And then Restore Your Shore um, has just this whole in-depth, you know, videos and tutorials and all sorts of uh, resources to guide you through doing a shoreline restoration project on your own. Uh, another resource is called Score Your Shore. This is all kind of, you know, in the same categories or in the same area of the DNR website. Um, but the Score Your Shore is a good thing to use if you're just interested to know how is my shoreline doing. You can print out this, you know, Score Your Shore, walk outside, and just run through the questions and it will go through questions related to your buffers, but also questions related to your lawn care, um, maintenance of your septic systems, just all sorts of things on your property that might be affecting the lake or a stream that you live on. Um, and then just finally wanted to mention that, that the PCA does have an impaired waters map um, that you can click on if you want to know water quality information or if you just want to see like in your whole area, maybe not just the lake that you live closest to, but you just want to know in my county, how are the lakes doing? Which lakes are, you know, quote unquote clean? Which ones, you know, do I maybe want to go swimming in and which ones do I maybe not want to go swimming in? Um, so those are all some good web resources. I will send out an email tomorrow that has all of these links in there so that you can easily access them as well as a recording. And I included my contact information as well. If you want to directly follow up and send me an email with more questions. Um, we do for people who live on lakes in particular, um, we do also have a semi-periodic lake newsletter that I send out. So you can also ask if you want to get added onto that. And I'll periodically send out information about aquatic invasive species and just other issues that affect lakes in particular. Okay, so that is the end of our presentations, but we are able to stick around for a little bit longer and answer questions if there are any questions that people weren't able to get answered via chat while we were talking. Um, so thank you for joining us. And if you do want to stick around and ask questions, I think it's probably OK if you unmute yourself or just start typing, typing stuff into the chat there. And thank you, Cameron and Tara. One new message. Okay. I'll just I'll just keep hanging out here in case in case somebody uh, you know decides to unmute and ask a question in the next minute or so. But hopefully we have addressed everything you could ever want to know about buffers in one hour. <laughs> There's obviously. <laughs> Well, obviously lots and lots and lots of detail to provide. Um, and, you know, if you, if you have a property with a lake or a wetland, you can expect to spend many years getting to know it. Sorry again, how do I get the recording? Um, I'll be sending out an email. If you, are, if you are in here, that means that you had to enter your email address um, to register to get on. And so I should be able to um, send an email to everybody with the recording or a link to the recording. Um, hey, Angie, great job. Thanks, Beth. How's it going? It was good. My mom joined from Kansas. That's exciting. Um, okay, so we do have a couple of maintenance questions for you, Cameron. These are in your wheelhouse. One is, could you speak more about maintenance like burning in the spring? And another is, should I remove buckthorn from a riverbank? Yes, you should remove buckthorn from a riverbank. Um, you do have to be careful about um, if you're going to choose to use herbicide as a follow-up treatment versus um, like the black plastic or something else, or if they're, yeah, if they're too big to pull. Also, sometimes you don't want to pull from a riverbank because it can um, cause a lot of instability. So, but you do still want, it, it's still beneficial. Otherwise, you're going to have a, a difficult time establishing um, an undercover there because of the, the shading that buckthorn is known for. 
So it is something that you want to remove wherever you see it. It just can be a little bit more tricky depending on that. And then as far as uh, burning, I don't know, Tara, if you want to speak more to that. I don't have as much experience with buffer burning. Sure. Yeah, burning can be a, an important tool. Um, it A lot of our the native plant species that we um, showed tonight, because of their deep root system, they're actually well adapted to being burned. A lot of their energy stores are underground. So you can use burning to help kind of tip the scales to favor those really deep rooted native species and set back some of the maybe more weedy or invasive species. Um, I wouldn't burn just to burn, I guess. I would burn with a, a follow-up plan in mind. Either um, you're gonna try some interseeding and you, you wanna help get those, you know, those native species back there. Um, I guess I wouldn't just burn it, just to burn it off and start fresh. Um, Typically the time of year that burning takes place is the springtime when the snow melts and the ground starts to dry out. It's also the time of year that there's a, a, typically a, a burn ban on because things are so flammable. Um, so to burn, you really need to, um, well, you need a local permit. Um, and typically the local permits also wanna see that you have a variance from the DNR to be able to burn during those times. So I just would caution you to, jump through those hoops and get the, cause you'd hate to have it um, get out of, um, out of hand or have somebody call and report that there's a fire and you don't have the necessary paperwork in place. So I just wanna caution that, um, but no, burning can be a really great tool. Um, if you have any trees or shrubs planted in there or ones that are already there that you um, care about, there's some trees and shrubs that are more adapted to fire than others. There's also things you can do to protect. You can um, mow down close around a tree if you're that you want to protect, or stand by with a hose and just keep it keep it wet throughout the burn if you're if you're hoping to keep it protected. It looked like Catherine Bender had a question. Do you want to unmute and ask? Yes. Hi. Actually, I just saw in the chat line this might actually um, somebody was asking about riprap. So I was on the Restore Your Shoreline and just kind of going through it. And I saw where they cut down branches from dogwoods or willows and alternated them into bundles and put that onto the shoreline to kind of build that buffer, especially if you have uh, ice, ran um, ice ridges. Have, have any of you guys seen that done? Is it effective? I mean, I know that the willows and the dogs would, would recede I mean, they would set down roots, but I, I understand the pro philosophy behind it. Um, have you ever had any um, luck with that or seen it in use? But that was one of the options that they recommended instead of the riprap because it's still providing habitat for the animals. Or Cameron, do you want to take that one? I know that I've seen yeah. it, but I, I don't know enough about it, I think, too. I've sure. seen that as well used for um, kind of the, yeah, the shoreline stabilization, like what you're saying, you can, yeah, you can bundle up um, branches like that and kind of use that. And then usually you stick uh, live stakes is what they're called, uh, dogwood or willow. You kind of stick that through to help establish the growth through the, um, yeah, the bundles so that you, you're still getting vegetation growing on there while you're, while you're buffering it with those bundles is, is the best that I can speak to that. So, yeah. so do you think that it would be, I, I've got a building that's established already and it's right on the lake. I mean, it's literally three feet from the ice ridge. Um, and obviously I wanna prevent any further damage. So is that where that would, so for me, it makes sense because that would give it kind of give a little bit more than rocks when the ice melts and comes out, you get that, the, the ice crashes, so to speak. Yeah. The other the other tool that you could use, you kind of want to build build up your shore a little bit is what I'm hearing. Right. So you can use these big, they're like coconut logs. And I think it probably is serving the same function. You put them a few feet even into the water, you stake them in, you can plant into those um, into those logs, you can plant behind them. And it does just help stabilize and kind of build back your shoreline. If you have a lot of, 
of ice heave though, or wave action, um, it, it, you know, you'd want to look at that before investing a lot of, of money and time into doing that if you, if it's just going to get pushed up again. Um, but I would say if you can schedule a site visit, whichever county you're in, um, that's something that could potentially be a cost share project that they would design. And, for and what did you call it? Coconut logs? They're like these like core logs. Am I using the right language there? Bi yeah. Maybe bi bio logs or similar yeah. speak. Yeah. It, picture it like um, a pair of nylons that have stuff stuffed into them, except sure. giant, giant nylons. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I saw that there was also some questions in the chat about rip wrap and um, you know, we almost always recommend native plantings instead of rip wrap, um, but we do have a few projects and I know that Mike Eisensee has worked on some of them and he's on here if he wanted to unmute. We do have a few projects in, you know, like high wave action areas or along the riverway where we've sometimes done a combination of rip wrap with plants planted into it so that the rocks are helping to stabilize the soil and plants getting planted into it. Um, Mike, I don't need to put you on the spot, but if you wanted to say anything on that, you could hop in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, Angie. Um, I'm actually picking my kids up from skiing right now. Okay, uh, sorry. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, yeah, it's a, it, this is great, and and it's a really great question. Uh, there, there, there are lots of techniques that fall under the, uh, the approach called bioengineering. And so we've been working in Carnelian Marine St. Croix Watershed District in the northern portion of Washington County on a lot of these bioengineering techniques um, that, that basically establish a, uh, you basically want to establish a toe on the slope. Uh, and sometimes we can do that with just a coir log and reestablishing plants. Um, other times we can do it with, uh, with a these, uh, these brush waddles or with live staking. Uh, but in some areas, especially like on Big Marine Lake or Big Carnelian Lake, when we're on the ice ridging side of the lake, we need, really need to establish it with, you know, rock, rock toes so that when those ice ridges come in, it lifts the ridges up over uh, the native planted area. And so, um, so there's a, there's a whole number of techniques, but a, a lot of times my, I really like the question about, you know, if you have existing riprap, you know, is it a good idea to, uh, to reconfigure or remove uh, and restore to native plants? And the answer is yes, starting from the, the upper portion of the bank and working your way down uh, over time, uh, you, can actually, uh, you can actually get rid of a lot of the rock and restore a lot of that really critical habitat without endangering the stability of your shoreline. And so hopefully uh, for those for folks in Washington County, uh, you can schedule a site visit with some of the designers of the conservation district who work with all these different techniques. Oh, I, I just had a comment. Yeah, we did put that uh, rock along the lakeshore um, in the last year because we were getting some erosion. Um, from wave action. It's not a terribly big lake. And the other thing we're dealing with are two beaver that are cutting down the trees along the, the lake shore as well. So it's, it was coming at us from a couple of different directions. Um, at the same time, we are trying to put in native plantings. I was the one that had the question about the shade because it's largely sh shady along that shoreline. So mm -hmm. anyway. But we'll look into more of that. I mean, there are places we can plant more. We did start up along the top. Um, it's kind of a, you know, a, a, you know, it's probably about a 10 foot drop at an angle, like about a, I don't know, 50 or 60 degree angle coming down. So we did put the rock along the, the base, but we have a lot of places we can, we still need to, to do plantings. And so we'll have to get this shade list from this blue, that resource you yeah. gave me yeah yeah so yeah. We'll, we'll we'll be doing a lot of that this spring and then the beaver i guess they're there to stay so they're just kind of picking and choosing which trees to gnaw on or chop down <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean the thing about lakes lakes rivers wetlands they are dynamic systems so it's you know every situation is so unique and it's really easy for us to give a presentation about, you know, how to make a butterfly garden and everybody making a butterfly garden in their yard is gonna have a relatively similar simple process, but, you know, lakes, wetlands, streams, 
It's just all so unique in their dynamic. They're always changing. They don't stay the same from one year to the next. There's wet years and dry years. And yeah, it, it does get really tricky. Okay. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I think we hit just about all of the major questions. And um, you all enjoy your evening. Stay in touch. <laughs> Bye. Bye.